This episode of The Honeydew is brought to you by Upstart, Keeps, Coors Pure, and ExpressVPN. More on that later. Let's get into the dew. The Honeydew with Ryan Sickler. Welcome back to the Honeydew, y'all. We're over here doing it in the Night Pan Studios. I'm Ryan Sickler, ryansickler.com, Ryan Sickler on all social media. want to make sure I tell you about my tour dates. Now, listen to this intro because there's more info in here that you're really going to like and you're really going to want to be a part of, all right? Uh, tour date, September 16th through the 18th. I'm in Phoenix at the House of Comedy. September 30th to October 2nd, I'll be at Helium in Indy. I'm doing Vegas with Tom Segura October 8th and 9th. I'll be headlining the Brea Improv October 28th. More dates are coming. We're putting them on the books. Go to ryansickler.com. Uh, join the email list. You'll be among the first to know new dates. Uh, the website for this show is thehoneydewpodcast.com. And please make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel. People ask me all the time, how can we help? How can we help? Subscribe to YouTube. It's free. You're watching it anyway. Hit subscribe. It means nothing to you. It means everything to us. It's super important. Um, and the Patreon. It, the Patreon is the honeydew with y'all. If you or someone you know has that story that has to be heard, please submit it to honeydewpodcast at gmail.com. This community is growing and growing. I mean, I, the stories are just, they're not stopping. They're not stopping. Um, and I'm not stopping. So if you're in for the long haul, sign up for your year. You'll get over a month free. Um, we're now giving you the Honeydew uh, ad-free a day early at no additional cost. You get the entire back catalog of the Honeydew with you all, plus new shows. Five bucks a month, all right? Um, also, want to let you guys know now that ringtones of my laugh are finally available for you people who've been asking me for a decade, okay? Go to iTunes. Go anywhere you get ringtones. Ringtones of my laugh are available in the iTunes store. Uh, you just have to go search my name, scroll down to ringtones, hit it. They're there. Or just go to ryansickler.com. There's a link that can take you out there, all right? Um, you guys have been seeing these D1 athletes that have now allowed the scumbag NCAA is allowed to sponsor now, or these kids are allowed to make money, and everybody's out there sponsoring these D1 kids. Well, this ain't D1 over here. This is the honeydew, okay? I want some honeydew athletes. I'll sponsor you. I'll throw you some merch. Go wear my shit out there where you are. I already got Three on board right now, okay? I got a guy named Marcus Everett, who's a bow fisherman, and this dude is a straight fucking killer. I got Caden Wood, who's a D2 pitcher at Seton Hill, went to the College World Championship this year. I got a young surfer named Beck Adler, who's one of the top uh, surfers in his age range right now in the world. So uh, you got to be good. I'm not just taking any fucking assholes out there drinking beers and throwing cornhole. Give me a Give me a bowler. Give me a guy that throws darts. Give me a Frisbee golfer. But you got to be good. You got to be good, and you can't be D1. That's the other thing. I'll sponsor a D1 player. I will. But I want you D2s and, and JUCOs and shit. All right? Um, that's the news. That's everything. Also, no, no, no. This is a very important announcement, actually. Very important announcement. My man, Ash, the backbone of this show, is moving to uh, Austin, almost at Nashville, with everybody else. Going with the YMH crew. So... I'm looking for people that want to help. I'm looking for people who are fans of the show that know what is going on here, and that's what I'm looking for. I do not need marketing or audio mixing. I'm looking for video and editing, production, all right? So if you're interested and you think you have the skills and you want to help and you live local, then hit me up. All right, hit honeydewpodcast at gmail.com. Just put, you know, honeydew work or something like that in the subject line. All right, now that that's all out of the way, you know what we do over here? We highlight the low lights. And uh, this guy's one of my favorite fucking low lights. It's not his first rodeo here on the do, y'all. Please welcome back to the honeydew, Joey Diaz, everybody. Welcome back to the honeydew. What's happening, brother? It's so good to see you, man. You look good. You really do look good. You got a little your sun kiss there. You out there with the family in the in the summer Jersey sun. Fucking tremendous. You look it good. It really dude. is tremendous. I go to this. I go to this city pool. Like it's like a pool for the for the town. Mm -hmm. You you got to see this fucking place. I mean, it's basketball court. Yeah, you were telling me baseball court. Fucking three pools, slides for the kids. Great food. So 
like when I finish up here with you, I'll shoot over there and run in the pool for a while, cool off, and I'm out of there by 3.30. They have an old man section. It's perfect. <laughs> they got fucking, you know, it's 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 kids up to like 11. Yeah. And then it just drops off to old people because if you're 15 and over, you go down to shore. Yeah, you're not fucking around at you the know? pool yet. Yeah, yeah. No, so I'm good at the fucking pool. The shore is a fucking madhouse. Yeah but I'm good at the fucking pool. How you doing? I'm good, man. Everything is great. I can't complain at all. I'm healthy. Things are going well. I got you back. And uh, speaking of summer, we're picking up in June of 1990. <laughs> what, wait, what year did we start in? What year did we actually start? Your birth year is what? When were you born? Uh, who the fuck knows? 63. 63. We're, we're only 30 couple years in. We're only in 1995. I love it. All right. So June of 95 is where uh, we pick up. You had just talked about, I think you just had your daughter, right? Or no, 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 you, no, not 95. No. You're, go ahead. You take it. Not, June of 95 was when I decided that my relationship with my daughter wasn't going to work. Got it. Uh, I had gone up to Detroit to do Joey's comedy club. And I met a girl. I had been, uh, without a girlfriend for a long time. I was just having little affairs and stuff. And I met a girl in Michigan and, uh, she came to visit me in Boulder right after that. And we hit it off and she was moving to Seattle. So from Boulder, she went to Seattle, like in beginning of June. And I thought about what was going on in my life at the time, you know, and my wife hooked up with a husband and, you know, they were trying to start a family and I wanted to be a comedian really bad. And uh, I, I had my job at the sports betting service. So I said, you know what, let me go on the road. Let me pack my shit in storage, give up this apartment. There's no reason for me to pay for this apartment. And let me um, go to Seattle for the summer. Okay, so this is how you ended up getting up to Seattle. Okay, yeah, because I yes. know about your Seattle days. I didn't know it went. For, okay, go ahead. So, so it was like uh, June twenty fifth of nineteen ninety five. I can't believe I mean, that I, fucking day. I, I was fucking heartbroken. Like I was heartbroken because deep down I knew I wasn't coming back. Like I, I just said to myself, I'm going to come back in September and make, I, I planned on making like a hundred grand from September to January with the sports betting service. So I, I was like, I got that job, but I really want to be a fucking comic. You know, this thing with my daughter is not going to work the way I wanted to let me go out there and find who the fuck I am and find some success. And then I'll come back and be a father. That was my plan, you know? Okay. So I loaded up my car. I had a, a, a Datsun B210 that, that I bought. That's what we that had, wasn't, bro. That's what we had. That was fucking Datsun. I'm driving a Datsun yeah. in 95. A B210. I know that fucking exact the car. the fucking car was tougher than that. I couldn't yeah. get rid of that car. Yeah. That Honda's car finally bad. ended up I'm getting towed. <laughs> But uh, that's how it went out. They just got they just pulled it out for you. Oh, let yeah. me tell you something. The fucking the, the side panel fell off at the end. The side panel was off. The brakes were. I mean, that car did me. I think I paid 800 for that car. I drove that car from, from Colorado to Michigan and Baltimore. Probably yeah. 10 times yeah. each place I went. They're just you know, little lawn. Car. If you take care of them, they're little lawn mowers. They'll run forever. It, it, yeah. it was a fucking beast, that car. Yeah. I owe that car my life. I saw Stanhope and I did the same thing. I put a hanger in the back seat. I put everything in the trunk from a Frisbee to boxing gloves, everything, you know, so I could swim, goggles. Mm -hmm. I brought a suit, you know, and I said, let me do this fucking triple run, which will get me up to Oregon. Yeah. And then I'll go to Seattle. I'll get to Seattle by Saturday night. So I'll never forget leaving uh, Boulder and headed to Ogden, Utah. 
That was my official first one nighter out of Boulder. Is that right? Ogden, Utah. And that's your first yeah, headlining hour uh, out of Colorado. No, I wasn't headlining. Oh, at you are okay. I was, fe- I was featuring for Tribble at the time. Okay, I was doing Tribble runs. I wasn't featuring at clubs. I was MCing at clubs. There was no feature work in my life. I was dying to be a feature. I had about twenty five minutes. I was dying to feature, but nobody would feature me. So Tribble featured me. I think it's seventy five dollars a fucking night, you know. Mm-hmm. And I I did Wednesday it's still, and Ogden. It's still, it's I think it's still seventy five. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I went to fucking Ogden, some spots in Wyoming, and then the last night was Lagrange, Oregon, and. That day, I realized that I was just, I don't know how many hours from Seattle. So I pretty much finished my fucking gig. And I just shot to Seattle on Saturday night. And she stripped. So I met her at, she left the key under the fucking thing for me. And I waited for her in the apartment. I got there about 1.30. She got home about 2.30. I still remember being with her that night. And waking up Sunday, and the first thing we did was go down to the Comedy Underground. And it was closed. But I didn't give a fuck. I just wanted to touch the building. Yeah, I had heard so many great things about that club. I was like, fuck this. I'm just going to fucking go down there and touch the building. They had a number on the wall. And I called it. Nobody answered. You know, it was a fucking nightmare. But I didn't give a fuck. I just wanted to be in fucking Seattle and do comedy. That was it. You know, that was all that was on my mind. I'm just putting this phone on airplane mode so nobody fucking bothers me. <laughs> there you go, cocksuckers. <laughs> These cocksuckers love to bother me when something good goes on. When I'm sitting here not doing nothing, nobody calls. No, I know. Nobody. Yeah. Once you're doing something, everybody wants to call you back. That's why today I didn't call nobody in the morning. Because if they don't answer, then they call you back exactly when you're doing a fucking podcast. So I got up this morning. I shipped 418 mugs for Patreon. Damn, all right. And then I went to the fucking gym, finished out my workout week, and got back. So back to 95. So I'm living in Seattle. And that I'll never forget that that Monday was the open mic. And I ran down there and signed up. I think I was like number two. And that night, all of a sudden, a kid walked in with a backwards hat on and a Boston Red Sox hat with long hair. <laughs> yeah, I know who that dick is. <laughs> and, it was, and it was Josh Wolf. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, he went on stage. He was well known there. I went up to him. I, You know, you're from Boston. I'm from Jersey. You know, we started talking. He probably thought I was fucking weird. You know, he was looking at me like, what the fuck? <laughs> and, uh, I chased him down for like three fucking days. Like he told me where he worked at Lobo Loco and all this shit. And I'm like, fuck it. I got to hook up with you. You got to make this help me out, you know? And, uh, it was funny because I got to Seattle. I went to that open mic that Monday and I got a bunch of numbers from people like who to call for bookings and shit. And I started calling people and everybody called back. Like I got there on Saturday night. I went on stage Monday and by Wednesday, I already had a gig for the weekend. I was playing Moscow, Idaho with Vince Valenzuela. Great fucking guy. He's in LA. I think he's not doing comedy anymore. I don't know what he's doing, but that was my first weekend. Moscow, Idaho as a fucking feature act for John Fox. So I'm like, wait a second. Things are moving fast. I got in with uh, the chick from Oregon that was booking, Donna Richards. I got in with another chick who was Josh Wolf's manager. She had a bunch of rooms. I was in with Tribble. And I was doing spots at the fucking Underground, which was just a tremendous club, you know? Yeah. So I, I was in Seattle maybe two weeks, and I was already rocking. Like, I, you know, in Boulder, I would do like – five sets a week and I had to drive all over the fucking world in Colorado. I had to go to Wyoming and shit. 
in Seattle, we had two spots on a Monday night, four spots on a Tuesday, six spots on a Wednesday. There was a spot on Thursday. You know, there was always something. It was just fucking mind boggling. And I'm having a great time with the broad, you know, she's stripping at night. I'm helping to count of money. I'm taking 20, 20 for me, 20 for her. You know, I'm dropping hundred dollar bills on the floor and stepping on them. Fucking hysterical. Fucking hysterical. She was great. You know, we still talk. Her and I still Do talk. You? That's great. You know what? Let me Would, say this. Because, again, I want to step out of this. Because I'm not just a comedian. I'm still a fan. I'm a fan of comedy. I'm a student of the game. And I'm, I'm a fan of yours, obviously. And what I love, for me, what I love hearing is that you know, you forget that these these people like you and, and you know, they started somewhere. And to hear your excitement about, I know exactly what you mean. I don't give a fuck if it's Sunday at 1 o'clock and this building's closed. There's energy coming off that fucking building. I want to go be around it, touch it. I don't care if it's got the gates on it. I want to peek in the window. I want to know. And then you go the next night and you run there. And you're number two on the list or very early because you want to fucking like, I love hearing that. That's what I love. I love that young Joey, did, you know, that's where it started. And there you are now you've, you've left this thing. And what people don't realize, I think a lot of people don't just don't think about it if they're not in this world, but this job we do, it's selfish. It's a selfish thing. I'm not saying that in a negative way, but so, the definition of so, it's, we have left our families, we have left friends, we have left our homes, we have left everything in search of something that just we ourselves want to do and fulfill for ourselves. And that's a very selfish act. And then once you get into this motley crew of fucking people in comedy, rarely do we really get to hang out unless we have a gig in town on the, and the same night at the same time in the same venue. Some nights I see you, we, we give each other a little love because I'm doing the 10, you already did the 8. We don't get to kick it. Maybe at a festival, something like that. It's almost, it's a solo sport. Comedy's a solo, it's like tennis. It's you out there. So I love hearing that you were stoked just to be out there in the building. And this is like your real, this is your real start in comedy right here. 1995. It yeah, was, it was great. really, it was really, when I think about it, it was a lot of fucking fun. Like I was just having, I was probably making 800 a month, you know, but who gave a fuck? Right. And then back then you're not thinking about agents or where, you know, you're just trying to get your feet under you, your legs and build this fucking routine that, that can hopefully carry you. And then you can build other places. So you are also getting those triple runs. You're probably building material pretty quickly. You had a lot of spots. Yeah, I was, it was, uh, I was a student of the game. You know, I didn't cap my only, I had rent. My nuts were rent child support and my pager that was <laughs> yeah, it yeah. i wasn't paying any bills there was no credit cards i didn't have anything i was very hand to mouth it was very old school but i didn't give a fuck i was living it i was in it when, when you're in it like that you don't give a fuck you don't even see anything and I, else and i'll never forget that you know this girl was a sweetheart but she stripped there was some things I couldn't deal with. You know, there was a lot of things when you date a stripper, you have to be a strong type of dude. And I wasn't strong for that. You know, I would go to pick her up and my heart would break, you know? So I was actually thinking of coming back. Like I called the sports betting thing in mid August. And I said, Hey, can I come back? And they're like, absolutely. When do you want to come back? And I go, how about like, fucking September 8th or something. It was some date. And uh, they go, yeah, we'll see you then. And I was all set to go. And I hung up the phone and all of a sudden John Fox calls me. And he goes, what are you doing Labor Day weekend? And I go, nothing. I was supposed to leave that weekend. Yeah, that's late. Yeah, September. Fucking crazy. That is. I was supposed to leave that weekend. And he goes, I have a weekend for you as a feature. This was my first feature spot in a club. Yeah. Never mind it being the fucking underground. Now I could talk some shit. 
I was opening up for Laurie Kilmartin. Yeah. Out of, out I just of saw San her at Francisco. the improv the other night. Yeah, I love I love her. I think she's great. I love Laurie yeah. Kilmartin. Me too. Laurie was a pro yep. already in ninety five. Wow, okay. Not you can't take anything away from Laurie. No, I just she's followed her at the improv a couple weeks. Yeah, she is. She's man. stronger than she death. Is. So she was I was so stoked. You know, and I put it in God's hands. I was like, if God wants me to be a feature act and I'm here. Fuck it. It doesn't look like I'm going back to Colorado. You know, it just doesn't look like I'm going back to Colorado. So it was, uh, we had a great summer. Her and I were fucking nuts. Like we would just do the craziest fucking things, you know? And I got to start hanging around with Josh and Brody Stevens and Tana Manu and Gavin. There was just this crew that I had fit into I had that in Colorado, but I really didn't. Those mm-hmm. guys started. Uh, the reason why I left Colorado is because those guys started uh, backbiting me. Yeah. Like those open micers started talking behind my back. And they're the ones. One of the guys in Denver was the guy who got me thrown out of the comedy works. Oh, so I was really? kind of like, I don't, I don't want to really, really be a part of comedy clicks. But those guys were a great crew. Let's take a quick break and tell you about our first sponsor, Upstart. So many Americans experienced financial hardship in the last year, and Upstart can help you regain your footing and get things back on track. Upstart is the fast and easy way to pay off your debt with a personal loan all online. So whether you're paying off credit cards or you're consolidating high interest debt or you're funding personal expenses, over half a million people have used Upstart to get one fixed monthly payment. I know you guys are using it because they keep coming back and you guys keep hitting me up and being like, damn, I got a good deal. And uh, it's really helping you out. I wish I had something like this back in the day. I just did consolidations and paid interest out the butt. But Upstart knows more than just your credit score, and it's expanding access to affordable credit. So unlike other lenders, Upstart considers your income and current employment to find you a smarter rate for your loan. With a five-minute online rate check, you can see your rate upfront for loans between $1,000 to $50,000, and you can receive funds as fast as one business day after accepting your loan. Find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today when you go to upstart.com slash honeydew. That's upstart.com slash honeydew. Don't forget to use my URL to let them know I sent you. All right. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. Go to upstart.com slash honeydew. Our next sponsor is Keeps. As guys, so much of our identity is wrapped up in our hair from how it feels after getting a fresh cut to the way it's perfectly styled before going out. That's why when we get in our 20s and 30s and start noticing the first signs of hair loss, it definitely feels like panic time. Because let's face it, no guy is ever ready to go bald. Thankfully, now there's Keeps, the simple and easy way to keep your hair. Did you know two out of three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35? The best way to prevent hair loss is to do something about it while you still have hair left. Get treated from home. You used to have to go to the doctor's office for your hair loss prescription, but now, thanks to Keeps, you can visit a doctor online and get hair loss medication delivered right to your home. They make it easy, and they deliver your medication every three months so you can say goodbye to pharmacy checkout lines and awkward doctor visits, okay? If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to Keeps.com slash Honeydew to receive your first month of treatment for free. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash Honeydew. Now, let's get back to the do. You know, that whole crew was a great crew. I missed my uh, daughter, so I took a ride back to Boulder with the stripper. We drove back to Colorado like in mid-September to get my stuff out of storage and all that shit. And my ex-wife let me see my daughter, which was fucking rare. Yeah. You know, I still have the picture from that day, you know. That's nice. It's in my wallet. And uh, that was one of the last times I basically, I think I saw it two times after that over the years. And then, uh, we went back to Boulder. We saw my daughter, we brought my ship back. And then something happened that was fucking like, was not in my cards. I didn't even see it coming. I had heard about the San Francisco comedy competition and the Seattle comedy competition. I had heard about these things and I never knew I would be good enough to perform at one of them. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm yeah. like, I'm not, 
I'm not going to be good enough. And one day Ron Reed came up to me and he goes, are you doing the contest? I go, I don't know. Am I good enough to do the contest? He's like, well, we're having auditions. Just get your six minutes ready. And I went down there, I auditioned. And a couple of weeks later, they got back to me and said, you made the contest. I was like, are you fucking kidding me? And it was like me, Josh Wolf, Aisha Taylor. Yeah, Aisha Tyler, Tyler, yeah. Um, a comic, an African-American kid that was funny as shit. He passed about two years ago. Oh. Uh, Flo- Floyd, Floyd, Floyd. And he had a, he used to go to, a, what's that shit where you're missing a kidney? Dialysis. Yeah, dialysis. Yeah. So I used to call him Floyd the Kidney. He used to live in <laughs> Portland, Oregon. He, he was from Michigan. God rest his soul. Fucking great kid. Funny as fuck. You know, and in your mind, you look at the, the festival and I'm like, well, there's Josh Wolf, there's Brody, there's Tana. There's I, didn't, I didn't know Brody went up to Seattle. I didn't know he was up there yeah, as well. Bro, that's, yeah. where I, that's where I met him. So I had it in my mind, I'm like, I'm going to do really good at this thing. And I remember going on stage the first night of the, of the contest at a pizza parlor. And I fucking took like 13th place out of 15 people. I thought I was going to fucking die. <laughs> I'm like, surprised to hear that. <laughs> I went home and I cried <laughs> and I looked at my set yeah. and I fucking revamped my set. I Fuck. kicked it up. I was up all fucking night putting the fucks where they belong. Yeah, in the and, lab. I you know, love that, it. <laughs> That's when I put the I fucks be- where they belong. Oh, I was fucking pissed. I'm like, I can't fucking do 13th place. And then that Tuesday <laughs> night, I redeemed myself. <laughs> that Tuesday night, I came in like fifth. And then Wednesday, I came in like fourth. Yeah. And then Friday, I came in like sixth. And Saturday, I came in like fourth. So I made the semi fucking finals. I'm like, holy shit. And everybody kept telling me, you're not going to make this anything because they don't like dirty comments. You're not going to do well. So I said, okay. So you have a week off and then you go back again. And I went back to the semifinals. And again, it was a nightmare. But they were, it was great. It was a great experience. There was this kid named James Inman. Do you know who that is? Mm-mm. Have you ever heard of James Inman? I haven't, no. James Inman. His goal was to stay sober. One of the funniest guys you'll ever work with. One of the funniest guys you'll ever see that didn't become a superstar. He was very funny, very Bill Hickish, very on his game. And uh, the secret to knock him off his game was to give him booze. (laughs) Okay. Okay. So, So he wasn't drinking. Like, he was crazy. One night he came in, he was stabbed. His wife stabbed him. He came he in bleeding. like freshly stabbed? <laughs> yeah, from a, a, to an open mic. He was bleeding. I mean, this crew was crazy. That is crazy. We, ha- we, ha- we had a Coke dealer upstairs. Because <laughs> up the, the Comedy Underground is downstairs. It used to be in a bar called Swanee's. Okay. And downstairs was the Underground. So there was a Coke dealer upstairs. I mean, it, it was great. So what we did was you gave James Inman tequila shots even though he wasn't drinking you had the waitress bring him tequila and he would drink them and then he would start going off on comics and it was classic he went up to ah i forget this comic's name he does a lot of spots at burbank and a lot of corporates now he never really made it in the comedy world he did great in the corporate world and uh he's a clean comic i'll never forget one night inman grabbed him and told him if you do another joke about your cunt wife up on stage, I'll fucking kill you. So we would send him over tequila that's what, shots. So he would drink tequila and snap like that? Oh, that's... And snap like a twig. And he'd go off on other comics and knock them out of that game. So it was perfect. And you're just I knew sitting how to... right in the cut, letting it all fall. And I'm a... <laughs> Fuck yeah. Because <laughs> when you're a comic and you do those contests, yeah. you got to learn how to piss on somebody's <laughs> leg. You got there right. But if you piss on somebody's leg too hard, you might crack yourself. You know what I'm saying? So... <laughs> <laughs> oh my god oh my god <laughs> sorry all right i cracked you know we we fucking did the 
He's drinking, the, uh, yelling at everybody. He's yelling at everybody. And guess what? I fucking did great with the semifinals. And I'll never forget that we ended the semifinal week. It was supposed to end on a Sunday night. And we'd know who was going to make it to the top five. David Crow won it that year. Mitch Hedberg was in it. Yeah. It was it was craziness. So uh that Sunday, I'll never forget, somebody gave us tickets to the Seattle Seahawks game. And like 12 comedians, we all Floyd J. Phillips okay. was his name. God bless his soul. Pena, me, Brody, Josh, Gavin, uh, Floyd, a bunch of us. I think Aisha Tyler. We all went to a Seahawk game, and we had such a great time. And then we went to McC- McCormick and Schmitz. Yeah, had a two dollar menu, the two dollar menu, a cheeseburger for two dollars, an order of fries for two dollars, clams on a half shell, two dollars. It was fucking great. So we uh, we did that, and then I made it to sixth place that night. As a dirty comic, I didn't make it to the finals, but I took a six to hear what Aisha Taylor, David Crow, Mitch Hedberg, and it was it was fucking great. I mean, everything was great. My future was looking great. When you do good in the Seattle contest, people from the area start start hiring you. Harvey's called, you know, the improv. There was a, an improv up in Seattle, was but it had closed. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, it had closed, and they still use the improv, that club, to do shows at. The guy that booked it was Alberto. So at this point, Cuban you're guy. still only a few months in, right? Are you even a year in yet, or how far in are we now in oh, your no. comedy? I, I started in 91. In Seattle, I mean. I'm talking about just in, in the Seattle scene. In Seattle, I was there about six months. And all this is popping that fast, huh? Popping that fast. That's really fast. You know that looking back how fast that is. Yeah, Yeah. it was fast. And then that Thanksgiving, they always had that show on Wednesday night. You know that big show on Wednesday? That's the biggest bar night of the year, man. Thanksgiving Eve. So what we did was, what we used to do was, we, me and Josh, Tana and Brody, a bunch of us would book out Wednesday nights and they gave you 65% of the door. So I don't know whose night it was on the night before Thanksgiving, but this is going to blow your mind. I'm up on stage the night before Thanksgiving and I get off the stage and there's a guy waiting for me. And he goes, hey, bro, listen, I'm doing a pilot in uh in uh LA for CBS and you're fucking perfect for it I'll be in touch and then as I was walking away from him another guy came up to me and he goes you'd be perfect for the Latino laugh festival God on, damn dude on, on showtime yeah we love for you to audition in January. Maybe send a tape. We'll fly you to LA. I was like, wow, things are really fucking happening. And then I got a feature spot. Uh, December something at the fucking underground. And I was opening up for this comic from Chicago. And it's Friday night. We're all down there. And I'm about to go up on stage. And that was the beginning of my bad luck. I'm waiting to go up. The MC is up. And when the MC hit the stage, four guys came in. Three guys came in. I'm talking to the manager. These three guys come in. They pay. And they're chatty. And they sit down. And I'm still talking to the manager. He sits him. Then he comes back. And we're still bullshitting. And finally, he goes, these fucking guys. And he goes over. And he tells the three guys, guys, if you want to talk, you could have stayed upstairs. And they're like, all right, we'll get our money back. And they follow Ron to the fucking table. Ron gives him back the 10 bucks or 15 bucks, whatever it was to get in. And the one guy goes, thanks. And he smacks Ron. Whoa. Ron's a 55 year old fucking man. These kids are kids. You know, they're like twenties. So I'm standing there with like three other comics. I don't know who the fuck they were. And nobody did nothing. 
So I jumped the fucking one guy, you know? <laughs> yeah, fuck I, yeah. I jumped him and I pushed the other guy and now we're going hey, at it. You need I those mean, spots, Joe. It. You need these spots. Yeah. No, <laughs> You're about to around. solidify yourself in that. Yeah, and Ron Reed's a good guy yeah. and shit. So I fucking go off, you know, and thank God there was a Puerto Rican guy from the Bronx upstairs. He was a cop, a Seattle cop, a city cop. He came down with his uniform on and he pulled me off the guys and I went and reached for his gun <laughs> while he was holding me. I loosened the holster. He's like, what are you doing? Yeah, what are you I'm doing? like, let's, let's shoot these motherfuckers, you know? And he's like, you're crazy. So they pull us apart. Let's. He us said, let's, let's, let let's us shoot. shoot. This let me and you shoot these motherfuckers. I was fucking, I was bone. I was, I was out of my mind. Sickle it. So, uh, I go up on stage. My shirt is ripped. Like the one guy grabbed it over here and it was ripped and it was like falling over and I'm sweating. And I, the feet, the MC brought me up fresh from the fight. And I go up on stage, fresh comedy. from the fight. They fucking know I got into a fight. They heard the commotion and they're like, you know, What's going on? I'm telling these three fucking guys, fuck them. I'm the king of swing. I'm talking all this nonsense. And finally, the bar gets surrounded by cops. I could see the cops all around the fucking bar waiting on me. Bicycle cops, all these cops. In Seattle, the underground was downstairs. So it rains a lot in Seattle. Yeah. So it's, it's really fucking humid. So fucking... This is something that I'll never forget. When you're waiting to go up at the underground, there's a beam. There's a beam that you stand by. And there's a table where people sit right there. And I'll never forget how many nights I would look at the table and people would be eating nachos. And there'd be big water bugs on their nachos. No. Because it was the basement. Yeah, all and that it was humidity damp. and shit. Yeah. And they had those big fucking Puerto Rican water bugs. <laughs> yeah, the ones that you see in the Bronx yeah. with the fucking tentacles and shit. Yeah. Oh I my know. God. They're huge. People would be eating nachos, <laughs> uh. not looking at the nachos, and there'd be a fucking roach on the nachos. Oh, God. I would go, Jesus Christ. <laughs> It was such a fucking wackadoo club at the time. But every time you stood by that beam, if you looked at people's dishes, you'd see a roach on one of the dishes. And nobody would ever say anything about the roaches. It was fucking terrible. I remember one night going up on stage and seeing a roach on some guy's leg, <laughs> like one of those water bugs, and he just shot up in the fucking air, you know? <laughs> so I get off stage, the cops ask me a a bunch of fucking questions and uh they let me go right now they say, are they are we'll they questioning you because you tried to unholster the the piece or just because of everything no, that went down no the Puerto Rican cop didn't wrap me out okay they they questioning me about the fight and what happened and what the details were and blah 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 blah, blah. okay they let me go the next day i get up and uh, I'm living in the U district with my girlfriend. And there was a fucking taco place. And they made potato tacos for 50 cents a piece. When you're a broke comic, fuck, you know. <laughs> yeah, so I would yeah. go there and get like eight, four dollars worth of tacos, which is eight tacos. And that would be my thing. I'm walking the next day to the taco place. And I'm not thinking about nothing, you know. I see that there's no cars. And I fucking cross the street. And I get to the other side, and next thing you know, two bicycle cops come up to me. And they're like, excuse me, sir, do you know what you just did? And I go, yeah, I crossed the street. And they're like, no, you jaywalk. You fucking jaywalk. I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, you jaywalk. I'm like, no, I didn't. And they go, listen, we got to give you a ticket. I'm like, this ain't fucking happening. This isn't fucking happening. And they're like, yes, it is. You're getting a fucking ticket. And I go, well, good luck. You know, I'm going to L.A. to fucking. <laughs> good luck. I'm going to L.A. to shoot a fucking CBS <laughs> pilot, bitch. You know, they gave me the ticket. And I looked at it and I go, this is what I think. I just ripped it no, up. Right? Did you? 
And I throw it away, right? I don't think nothing of it. I go get my fucking tacos. I forget all about it. About two weeks later, I'm downstairs minding my own fucking business. And my girlfriend comes home. And she goes, I got to go to the bathroom really bad. Can you stand here with the car? And I go, yes. I don't know. I don't know what the fuck happened. I don't know what it was. She yells down. It's going to, I got, stay down there. I got a call. Something happened. And her and I got into an argument from the downstairs to the window. I'm like, you better hurry the fuck up. I got to whatever. And she's like, I'll take my sweet time. Just give me 10 minutes or whatever. She yelled back. Do you know that the fucking cops came? For that? I'm standing outside. She's upstairs. <laughs> they came because you guys are yelling to, to each other. And I mean, people <laughs> walking on the street, nobody said nothing. And all of a sudden, a cop pulls up and he arrests me for fucking harassment. Nuh-uh. Yes. So that's my first fucking arrest. I get brought, I mean, I'm brought to the station and everything. I'm like, this is fucking embarrassing. Say something to him. And they're yeah. like, we can't say it. She's like, I can't do nothing. The cop's like, he can't do nothing. You know, you, you were yelling. Somebody fucking wants to press charges. I'm like, what the fuck kind of shit is this? So wait, so it's not your girlfriend who wants to press charges. You're telling me, no. you're telling me that if I'm an upset Karen, uh, I can just be like, there's a guy next door and I can press charges. Yeah, I don't fuck, know what the that's fuck crazy. happened. This fuck was, that. This was, it was just really fucking weird. Yeah. It was like misdemeanor harassment. Mm -hmm. So I get out. I don't think nothing of it. I got a court date. And about a week later, I'm sleeping and there's a knock on the door. And it's two cops. When I open up the door, I go, what's going on? And they're like, Jose Diaz, yeah, step aside. You're under arrest for failure to appear. You were supposed to be in court yesterday oh, no. for fucking jaywalking. <laughs> that shit went from a ticket to an arrest. God damn. So I got, a, I got arrested for jaywalking. <laughs> I got to tell you, you're the only motherfucker I know on the planet that's been arrested for jaywalking. I got plenty of friends that got tickets. And while I'm arrested for jaywalking, they're like, you were just here for fucking harassment. They're like, there's a fucking problem or some shit. So then guess what happens? I go back to fucking answer the charges for harassment. And what the fuck do you think happens? They press charges on me for the fight at the bar, at the no, underground. Oh, come on. That's coming back now. <laughs> now that comes back to bite me in the ass. And I get... Charged with assault. How's that not? And, all that. <sighs> and fucking, uh, they wanted to get me on a felony assault, even though it was self-defense, the whole That's fucking That's what I'm deal. saying. How's it not? This guy is over here getting beat. So they fucking put me on probation and made me go to the anger management. What's that like? Counseling. Like, what? Tell me what? What do you? Where do you go? What the fuck do you sit through and listen to? It was to? a fucking. It was a, It was just me and six other people. Two women, six guys. Women were in there about, too, huh? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like the one chick punched the boyfriend in the face, and the other chick stabbed somebody, a mailman or something. I don't fucking An know. An open mic comic. <laughs> yeah. I'm sitting there just getting worn out. You know, just getting worn out. And I did it for about three months. I actually Damn. went and it, and, it, and it helped out a little bit. And so I'm is, working, it, is it I'm once a week? Is that what it is? Weekly for three months? It was you like went? once a week. It's like therapy, yeah, it was like whatever. Once a week or something. Right. So now I'm involved with that, but I, I want to make money. You know, I needed to make money. Like I go, you know, I got a lot of dead time in the daytime. Let me get a job selling cars and I'll get to drive one of their new cars. Instead of driving my fucking Nissan around this fucking Sentra, whatever this fucking B210, this Dotson. Dotson. So I get a job at fucking uh, like a Honda place in Everett, in Everett, close to Seattle. Okay. 
They give me a job and they give me a car to drive. I'm loving life. I'm driving a new Honda. I'm doing comedy with a shirt and a tie on, you know. Were you really? I'm loving life. Yeah, I would go right from the dealership, right oh, to okay. the fucking. That makes uh, sense. To the open mic, you know, mm. and I would do whatever the fuck they had. And sure enough, I get pulled over. <laughs> One <laughs> night I get pulled over because the cop says I read a red light. Now, uh, not a red light, a stop sign. One thing about me is I stop fully for stop signs and shit. I stop for the fucking stop sign. I, I go, and all of a sudden the cop comes out of nowhere. He pulls me over. It's like 10 o'clock on a Friday night. Okay? He pulls me over. He goes, you ran the stop sign, blah, 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 blah. I tell him I didn't, but I stopped. He goes, all right, no worries. Let me just get your information. He comes back. He goes, Mr. Diaz, get out of the car. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> You're driving a stolen car. Ah, ah, nah, ah. They gave you a stolen car to deal with him. Oh, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh, I this can't even. End. I can't even. <laughs> it's just bang, 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 bang. So they kept me in jail from Friday to Sunday. Oh, man. For possession of a stolen car. And I'm telling them that the dealership gave it to me. They won't call the dealership because the thing, they finally, Monday, I call the dealership from the fucking jail cell. And they're like, let's check it out. I go, I can't come in to work because I'm in jail because you guys <laughs> reported a stolen car. And they're like, it's a mistake. Let them out. So now I get out of jail on Monday. I got to fucking, you know, take a bus to fucking Everett. They towed the car. I got to pay for the car to get towed. It's a fucking nightmare, you know? Oh, God. I, I don't know what the fuck to do with my life. This is terrible. Now, the people from L.A. start calling. And they're like, this pilot's going to happen. I didn't hear from them for like six months. I sent my stuff to the Latino Laugh Festival, and they actually flew me down. Oh, yeah? To the Laugh to the Laugh Factory. Okay. To do Latino Night on Monday night. It was huge in 1996. Latino Night was huge. It was Carlos Mencia, George Lopez, and Pablo Francisco, yeah. and Gilbert Escobel hosted it was huge the place was packed on mondays the last factory used to be packed on mondays so i don't know anybody i come down to fucking la they put me up at a hotel in the valley i i take a cab down another comic drove me i can't remember and i showcase them at the last factory and i meet a woman named marilyn martinez she's cool as shit i meet jeff garcia and I meet Felipe Esparza. I go back to Seattle. I'm doing my thing. I'm having a great time in Seattle doing the open mics, dodging the cops, <laughs> going to anger management. You know, it was always something. I'm making, you know, I so I started, I didn't go back to Boulder. So I I started my own sports betting service. I rented an office above Josh Wolf's uh, business. Me and the girl had broken up for a while, so I lived in the office. That's the office that had a bathroom, just a, a, a bathroom with a, a toilet, no shower. So I had to join a gym to take showers. Shower. But I, I can't tell you how many nights I, I had to take a shit at like 12 o'clock at night, and the cleaning lady would be in the building. You're not supposed to live in an office. Yeah. I was living in a rented <laughs> office for 125 they would try to knock on the door to come in to clean the office. I wouldn't let them. I'm working. Go away. I had an 800 number. I'm there, working. You could call me for football. And I was giving out picks. You know, I'm doing it by myself. And I'm having a great fucking time. And I remember how many nights I would just open the window and piss out the window. <laughs> and, and people would go, what the fuck is going on up there? I would just take my dick out. I'd be all drunk and coked up. And I would just piss out the window. Let me tell you something. A couple of nights I shit out that window. <laughs> I would just put my ass out the window and just drop two turds out of my ass and look down and they would fly down. It was fly. like the third floor. I had to. <laughs> uh... <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I shit myself. 
Oh God damn, and dude! I was at, and then I was friends with a guy that cook at the and you can ask Josh Wolf about this. Well, he's told me the you cook, guys have told me that story about the safe and all you stole up there uh, and all that. Oh, uh, <laughs> dragging it, was, it down the steps! <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, it was fucking crazy. So, <laughs> so uh, I'm living in this office. I'm kind of dating the crazy chick that I love. This is still and the one stripper. Day we go, yeah. Okay. And one day we go to a, she was into nature. She really liked nature. She's a hippie broad, you know. So we go to this fucking river and it's got like these little caves that you go into and the water just runs through you. It's tremendous. At that time, we went to see Pearl Jam at yeah. Waterworks. Oh, Park. yeah. Back then. I mean, it was just, we were fucking wow. living it up, me and this broad. I'm stealing 20s from her every night. <laughs> we're having a fucking blast. You know, yeah. so we're at this, uh, we're at this fucking reservoir. I'll never forget this, whatever this fucking thing is. And we're drinking bottles and James wine coolers. Yeah, I remember. And she's got, and she's got a tremendous ass, you know, and I'm looking at her ass. She's got a bikini on. And I'll never forget. I, we got into some type of argument. We weren't taught like she wasn't the whatever you want to do. It's fine. You know, whatever. And I'm like, I don't know what this girl's problem is. So I finished the fucking bottles and James. And I'm looking at her fucking ass. She's laying there and I'm looking at her pussy. And I take the bottle and I start rubbing it on her pussy with the bikini on. Just rubbing it with the with the pussy, with the bikini on it, rubbing it, rubbing it. And I can see her hips are starting to move. She's starting to get hot. <laughs> so, so I pull the bikini over and I take the bottle and I start playing with a clit and the whole fucking thing. And I start putting the ball into a pussy. No. And I'm just, right there. oh, you know me. We're, we're fucking freaks, me <laughs> right. and this girl. And I'm working her with the fucking bottle, nice and slow. She's moaning and groaning. I'm, I'm getting into it. I'm about to take the Cuban egg roll out <laughs> and yank it myself, right? I'm about to whack off and come on a fucking hair or her titties or whatever. I'm working her with this fucking bottle. I'm ready to go. I'm excited. And next thing you know, I hear... The suction from the bottle, she was about to have a period. No. So the suction, it created a vacuum when I was <laughs> going in and out. And all of a sudden, it squirted like the blood started filling no. up the bottle. I thought I cut her with the bottle, so I can't see blood. So I fainted. I just go backwards. <laughs> boom, and I faint. She wakes me up. She's putting ice on me and ice. shit. She's, She's putting water you. on me. Her pussy. <laughs> I thought I cut you. She's like, no, you just, you created a vacuum and you pulled the, the, the blood was brown. It was period blood. It was fucking brown and shit. Let's take a quick break and tell you about our next sponsor, Coors Pure. Living a balanced lifestyle is important, but it shouldn't stop enjoyment. That's when you reach for Coors Pure. Since it's all organic and has zero sugar, you can enjoy it without feeling guilty. Coors Pure is all about promoting balance and giving aggressive affirmations to everyday heroes. So whether you got that run in or you just got as far as putting on your running clothes, Coors Pure celebrates you. Coors Pure, it's organic. But chill about it. Look, I tell you guys, every week I found mine at Target. It's my favorite new light beer. It's organic. I've always liked light beer. Coors is the best one around. And so many of you have already gone out and tried and hit me up going, hey, this thing is actually really good. It is. Less calories, but the same alcohol content. So get yourself some Coors Pure. It's Coors Pure is the perfect beer to celebrate the wins of everyday life. So when you want to enjoy a beer while without the guilt, reach for Coors Pure. It's organic. But chill about it. Go to CoorsPure.com slash Honeydew to see where you can find Coors Pure. Celebrate responsibly. Coors Brewing Company, Albany, Georgia. Our next sponsor is ExpressVPN. Did you ever read the fine print that appears when you start browsing in incognito mode? It says that your activity might still be visible to your employer, your school, or your internet service provider. How can they even call it incognito? To really stop people from seeing the sites you visit, you need to do what I do and use ExpressVPN. Think about all the times you use Wi-Fi at a coffee shop, a hotel, or even at your parents' house. Without ExpressVPN, Every site you visit could be logged by the admin of that network, and that's still true even when you're in incognito mode. I mean, do you really want parents to see what you've been looking at? 
What's more, your home internet provider, I'm talking Comcast, AT&T, whatever, they can also see and record your browsing data. And in the U.S., they're legally allowed to sell that data to advertisers. ExpressVPN is an app that encrypts all of your network data and reroutes it through a network of secure servers so that your private online activity stays just that private. ExpressVPN works on all your devices and is super easy to use. The app literally has one button you tap and boom, your browsing activity is secure from prying eyes. So stop letting strangers invade your online privacy. Protect yourself at expressvpn.com slash honeydew. Use my link at expressvpn.com slash honeydew to get three extra months free. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash honeydew to learn more. Now, back to the dude. I'm like, this is a fucking nightmare. <laughs> I ain't never heard anything like that. <laughs> you jump started a period. <laughs> I jump started a period. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, man. Oh my God, you are something else, man. I love you. Her and I were oh, her God. and I were like so fucking good together, but we were so bad together. I know, I know exactly you know, what she the fuck really you she really like encouraged my comedy. Like I'll thank her. Like nobody knows like the people that helped me the most with my comedy was her and my new wife. My wife now, twenty one years, they have been women always help me. Women Same. were always very good to me. Same. So I, I mean, honestly, I Joey, I wonder if it does. I mean, you lost your mom. I lost. I mean, my mom left. My dad's gone, and there's just something I, I say all the time. Like the moms of my friends were always kind to me. Like women just have a different nature. The dads were always like, "You good? All right, see you later." You know, and it was out. The moms were. How you doing? Let me make you something to eat. What's going on? How we doing it? You know, always checking in. And then throughout my life, the women have always been good to me. Oh, I'm almost, very almost grateful. all of them. Me too. Me too. I'm, I'm very grateful to both of them. In fact, I talked to the girl from Seattle for the 4th of July. That's just I love on, that you still keep in we touch. Just, we just spoke on Monday. She sent me a picture on the 4th of her and her mother. And I looked at it Monday morning and I go, can you talk? And we talked a little bit and she said she's going to write a book. It's called the one chapter is called Seattle, L.A. and Joey Diaz. <laughs> the chapter about us. So. Uh, I was there and I'll never forget it was June of 96. And I was there a year already. And there was a rumor going around that. Doug Stanhope was coming up, Doug Stanhope was the hottest comic in America. Yeah. He had just won the San Francisco comedy competition and he was the hom hottest comic in America. I had met Doug in 91 in Boulder and again in 92. He had come to Boulder as a feature act where I worked. Uh, I was the house MC at the Tribble and he came back as a headliner a year later. And I always wondered what happened to him. I really liked him. In fact, he stayed at my house both nights because oh, okay. you did Boulder and then you got a hotel in Boulder, but then you had a night off. So I would tell the headliners if they were cool, you could stay at my apartment. I got an extra room, you know, he stayed with me, you know, and he was cool and I lost contact with him. I looked up to him. He was funny as fuck. And he was coming that June and I couldn't get the feature spot. So that Friday, I went to see Doug Stanhope. I'll never forget. It was the greatest live performance I had ever seen in my life. It was so good that I canceled my show on Saturday night and cried. <laughs> you cried. I cried because I knew I would never be as good as Doug Stanhope. Doug was on a different level in 96. It was, it was a different style of stand-up. He was just buck wild, you know, talking about that. He went to a strip club and the, the chick was so fat. There was a thong in there somewhere. And, you know, uh, I, I'll, I'll never forget Friday night. People were walking out. People were walking and he kept saying, where are you going? You didn't hear my tit fuck joke yet. And they're like, <laughs> fuck you. You know, it was just it was hilarious. He was. So that Saturday, I didn't go back down there. 
Like, I'm not even going down there. He was so good. I'm canceling my fucking gig. <laughs> and I got to get my life together. I got to get as good as Doug Stanhope. I mean, he inspired me so much that, you know, I went back Sunday night and I fucking told him, you know, he, you're fucking great. You became you became a fucking superb comic. I mean, I am embarrassed. Like I gotta catch up to you. And he's like, Well, listen, how about this? Catch up to me, and I'll be back here for New Year's, and you could open for me. Nice. New Year's ninety six. He goes, I just got it from John Fox. I go, perfect. So I had something to work for. You know? Yeah. So boom, 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 boom. I'm, I'm working, I'm doing all this shit. I'm finally fucking not getting arrested no more. I'm on probation. I'm still going to anger management. And then something fucking happened. I can't remember what the fuck happened, but I got pulled back into court. Like something I gave a hot UA, something happened. And they're like, you know, uh, I can't fucking remember what the fuck happened, but I got pulled back into court for like a review or something. And they were like, you're going to have to continue the anger management. You're going to get additional probate. I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? You know? And all of a sudden CBS called. It's like November of 96 CBS calls. And they're like, listen, we want you for this pilot. Nice. We're going to give you 25,000 bucks. Like I had never seen that type of money. I, I, yes. I know. Like, like, yeah. Like what? I'm like, what are you talking about? And they're like, yeah, just come down. We'll put you up. You're going to shoot for two weeks and then you'll go back to Seattle. And I'm like, whatever. I'm walking around. Like I didn't say nothing to nobody. I didn't tell Josh Wolf. I didn't say nothing. By this time, Josh Wolf had left. He was he had left in September. I know what happened. All right. So Josh Wolf leaves in September, and I miss Josh. At the time, I was living at Josh's guest house. Yeah, you babysat for him and shit. I can't. Yeah, I, I couldn't get over that. Yeah. We had robbed the safe. We did all <laughs> that shit. <laughs> And he leaves that September. And I get the job of a fucking lifetime. I get a job working for this telemarketing company for a new company that's going to advertise during football games for pizza. And you could order pizza from the television. This wild concept. This is 1996. This is this wild concept of telemarketing and they're paying me 20 bucks an hour. Damn. And bonuses if you sign pizza parlors, because that's what we had to do. We had to sign pizza parlors to to uh, to get into the network. And, I, and that's what the pitch was. So if for every pizza parlor you sign, you got like 10 bucks. I was knocking them fucking dead. So I'm there for like a month. I'm happy. CBS calls. We're going through with the deal. And my ex picks me up. Now I owed her money, like 200 bucks or something. The check was like for 800 bucks or whatever. She's going to cash a check, take the 200 and give me fucking six bills. Right. So she's got like her dog in the front seat and I'm sitting in the back seat. And we're going to go through the drive through. And she's going to give the teller her check and get the money back. We're at the fucking drive through and she's like, you're going to give me $300. And we get into a fucking argument over the money. I'm like, listen, I'm not going to give you fucking 300 bucks. I owe you two. Why would I give you three? And she's like going back and forth with me and we'll get into a fucking argument. And she goes, you know what? Fuck you. You're not going to get nothing now. And she rips up the check. Oh, shit. And I'm fucking furious. I go, what the fuck? I had people to meet that night. I was getting an eight ball. I had all this fucking shit. And I go over. She's like, fuck you. I go, fuck you. And she fucking punches me right in the fucking face. And I grab her hair. And she goes, ah. 
That's it. I'm calling the cops. And I go, fuck you. That's it. Fuck you. We fucking had it. And I run out of the fucking car. And the next thing you know, there's cops everywhere. So what do I do? I hide, I hide in the garbage can, nah. like a garbage dumpster outside the, 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 the tornado restaurant or something, right? So fucking, I tell this a big comic, his name is Rico. He's got to be six foot six, 300 pounds. He's African-American, darker than the night. And he shaved a spider onto his face. Like his, his beard, beard. Yeah. is a spider. So he's a street guy. He's from the Bronx. I call him up from the payphone before I jump in the dumpster. I'm like, Rico, listen to me. The cops are looking for me. Pick me up at this fucking, uh, at the whatever restaurant, tornado restaurant. I'll be in the dumpster. I go, how long will it take you? He goes, it'll take you about 20 minutes. Oh, you God. know, so I'm hiding in the oh, fucking dumpster. <laughs> and I tell him, pick me up in front of the restaurant. The dumpster is right next to it. I could see the cops going by and I fucking jump in the dumpster. I'm in a dumpster. There's fucking mice in there. Ugh. I'm fucking what the fuck is going on. And the next thing you know, I look at the thing and there's Rico 200 yards away going like this. And I'm like, Rico, pull over, come on over. And the next thing you know, cops come out again. Oh, so I just hide. In the, I hide in the fucking dumpster. So I'm in the dumpster from fucking four in the afternoon. It's got to be nine o'clock at night. No, I'm in a yeah. fucking dumpster. I'm For pushing roaches away oh, and rats. God. The fucking Mexican kids throwing garbage in there <laughs> next to me. I'm like, don't throw it on this side. Throw it on oh. that side. I give the Mexican like five bucks. I go, don't tell nobody I'm here. So finally, about nine thirty, I climb out of the dumpster and I'm walking through Seattle and I walk past the bush and there's two fucking cops waiting for me. So they arrest me. They take me down there. They say that, you know, uh, I pulled the hair, but she admitted to punching me in the face. The cops saw like I had like a black eye and they're like, you know, we'll just leave it at this or whatever. So fucking they didn't arrest me. Oh, good. They let, they let me go. But sure enough, I go see my probation officer the following week. And he puts a warrant out for my arrest for that. It didn't fucking stop for that. Yeah. So I'm like, God damn it. But she won't press charges. She's like, I punched him in the face. It's not fair. Blah, 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 blah. So they go, all right, don't worry about nothing. But probation is on my fucking ass. It's about December. Now CBS wants to know when I'm coming. And I tell them right after new year's, I'm opening up with Doug Stanhope. I'll have, Money from Doug Stanhope. I think the, the it was two fifty to feature then, two fifty for five shows. New Year's Eve, fifty dollars a 50 show bucks. up in Seattle. But I didn't give a fuck. I was opening up for Doug Stanhope New Year's. Yeah. Fucking. So I do the whole three nights with Doug. Fucking great. I think we added two shows. We did the countdown, and finally, on the last night, he goes, "Hey." When you come to LA to shoot that pilot, just stay there. He goes, you would do great in LA. He goes, fucking stay here, man. Don't leave when you come to LA. He goes, you could stay with me. I got bunk beds at my house. You could stay on the bunk beds. That was like the biggest confidence booster I ever had in my life. I, I, I didn't know what they even say to him, you know? So we did New Year's and uh, I had to go to, to LA to shoot for CBS, but there was a hitch. Probation wouldn't let me go. Nah. Why? Because you're going out Probation. of state? Yep. So I had to call CBS and tell them the truth. They contacted an attorney in Seattle and they set up a fucking special hearing. No way. To, for me to, I swear to God, wow. it was like fucking craziness. By this time, the stripper told me she was going to come with me. She's like, you're not going to leave me here by myself. I don't know anybody. I'm coming with you to LA. If you're going to be a fucking star, I'm like, I'm not going to be a star. I'm just shooting a fucking pilot and whatever. So, but here we had a kick. The probation department wouldn't let me go. 
they were like, he's not going to go. He's not able to go. He cannot leave the fucking state. So CBS went in there and fought for me with my attorney. And finally, the judge, it was the wildest thing. The judge had been at the shows. No. For New Year's. No. What a fucking How about that? That's my life. And he goes, listen, man, you're really funny. Wow. Uh, the joke of, the joke about the mall you did. Knew your shit, had too. Stitches. All right. Uh, he goes, I'll let you go to, to L.A., but do us a favor. Don't come back. <laughs> I told you to get he the goes, fuck you, out. You, <laughs> Politely. You can't come back. He goes, you've been arrested five times in one year. He goes, that's like a fucking record. Stolen cars, assaults, fucking jaywalking. You know, this cannot, this cannot, you know. So they said, you can leave. I was in fucking shock. But they have to continue anger management classes in Los Angeles when you get there and you can fucking leave. So on January, they, you know, it was a CBS pilot. They wanted me to be down there, but they weren't going to shoot till fucking the beginning of March. No. Oh. So I, once Seattle told me to leave, I was like, I'm out of here. So on January 20th, me and her with a dog got in an RV. We towed her car in the back and we headed to fucking Los Angeles. That we night, January in 20th, 97, are we in 97? Yeah, we're in 97. That's when I got here. I got here February 13th, 97. I just beat you. I got there January 29th. Of 1997. Damn, by two weeks, yeah. We got we got to San Francisco, and I was going to do a spot there one night. One of the comics from Seattle lived in San Francisco, and he goes, "If you're ever in San Francisco, let me know. Um, you know, I'll fucking uh, put you up at uh, whatever. You can stay at my place." So we get to San Francisco. We unhitch her car, and. We uh, fucking, you know, put the RV on a corner and we're in the RV. And for some reason, the RV, there was something wrong with the electrical system. So she's like, we got to have the RV towed. I'm like, what the fuck? I, I had like 800 bucks for the trip. Plus a little money CBS gave me like they gave me a per diem or some shit. While they're towing the RV, the back axle fell off. No. And the RV just lands oh, on the street. Shit. So we had to fucking get a hotel room. <laughs> oh man. For like for like three fucking nights. And but I got to do comedy all week in San Francisco. I got to do Rooster Teeth Feathers. Yeah. San Francisco. I, got to do I love all the comedy clubs. in San Francisco. I really oh, do. My the God. punchline I, is I did fucking the, awesome. The punchline. Oh, it's great. Cobb. I didn't do Cobbs. The guy was a scumbag then on Monday nights. Oh, really? Uh, but what I did the, like Rooster what, Teeth Feathers. The Purple Onion. Was it the Purple Onion was a great one too the, there? The yeah. Purple Onion. Some I did great that. Joints. I did something on Hate Ashbury. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then we finally got that I RV back on uh we finally got the RV back on like a Saturday and we headed to LA and we pulled in to LA Monday, January 29th, 1997. We pulled in, and I'll never forget, it was maybe 8.30 at night. We parked on Fairfax between Hollywood and Sunset, and we took showers, and we got in the Mazda, and we went to Acapulco, yep. where the, the comedy of Dojo was. Yep. I used, used to do to stand. Yeah, I used to do stand up up there, and they would fucking make those goddamn blended drinks while you were doing your set. You, you no one could hear you. You couldn't hear shit. Yeah, <laughs> yep. So I, I remember still pulling up Monday night, going to Acapulco, and then from there we went to the comedy store, and Don Barris was hosting, 
I went up there and Eddie Griffin was on stage. I couldn't believe I was in the world famous. I know, store. man. I know. That was the first time I walked in there. And I knew a guy named James Stevens III. I had opened for him in Seattle. He was big time at the store. And I'll never forget that he walked up to me like at midnight and he goes, do you want to go up, up at the open mic? There was like four people in the audience. I was like, are you fucking serious? Because I thought I'd never get a chance to perform at the comedy store. Because in those days, if you performed there, it didn't matter in what capacity. You could put it on your resume. Fuck yeah. That would be great on my resume. The mm-hmm. comedy store in the Seattle Underground. What are you fucking crazy? So he put me up at the comedy store original room. And I was like, holy shit. I was blown away. I'll never forget just going back that night to the RV and going, what the fuck? We met Doug Stanhope at Coaching Horses. Yep. I know. Yeah, that's a great, that was a great rock and roll bar. Yes, that it was. was. And uh, I never forget that he, he asked me, did you ever get paid for New Year's? And I go, no, I never got a check. And he paid me out of his pocket. You know, so that was great. He gave me 500 bucks instead of 250 and I still had the check coming to me. And uh, her and I lived in the RV. We got into an argument. I moved in with Stanhope. And I'll never forget that Friday, I was going to North Hollywood. I borrowed Stanhope's car. I was going to North Hollywood to apply for a telemarketing job. And that was the day of the North Hollywood Bank. Oh, shoot. yeah. I had just got here. I had just fucking got here. Yeah, the Bank of America fucking shooting. The Bank of America shooting. Yeah, dude. Those dudes walked down the street bulletproof and fucking. I, I remember seeing them finally take the one dude out live on TV. They shot him right through the head, and they wouldn't show that later in the news. But if you were watching live, they finally took that one dude out. But that shit was hours long. And I looked out because there was you, traffic. You were driving into it? I was driving onto the 101. It was tough to get on there. Yeah. And I finally went and said, fuck it. Somebody I had, in those days, there was no waves or nothing. You had to get the book. I had like a book in the car from going on the yeah, road. The Thomas Guide. The Thomas Guide. Yeah. It made me go to, through Barham. But Barham <laughs> was stuck. So I turned around and I went to a payphone. And I called the fucking employer and I go, listen, there's a lot of traffic. I can't make it up. And he goes, don't even worry about it. We're closing the office. There's a shooting going on. There's a fucking huge shooting going on. So I was there for that. And then I remember going back and Stanhope saying, listen, man, when I was at the store last night, I talked to Scott Day about getting you a showcase. I go, are you fucking serious? And he goes, wow. yeah, I got him to give you a showcase. So he goes, call him up. So I called Scott Day that Monday. You know, I still talk to Scott Day. I didn't know that. We're still friends on Facebook. He's like in Europe somewhere, Africa. So <clears throat> I fucking uh, call Scott Day on a Monday. And I go, Stan Hope referred me. James Stevens III referred me. Carlos Mencia referred me. I knew Carlos from Denver. And Scott Day goes, okay, you're on the list. He goes, it's going to be about six months. I'm like, well, you know, I, I had a brag. I'm like, I'm here to shoot a pilot at the CBS. So it'll be fine. Whenever you get to me, it'll be fine. You know, he goes, it's going to be about six months. I was like, fuck. I don't know if I'll be here in six months, you know. And sure enough, like a week later on a Friday, he calls me, he goes, and it was like Valentine's weekend or something like before Valentine's week. And he calls me up and he goes, do you want to showcase for Mitzi Shaw? We've had a couple fallouts. It wasn't even six weeks. It was like a week. I go, I'll be there fucking Sunday night. And I went down there like my life was on the line. This was bigger than me going to court was kidnapping this is fucking huge (laughs) i walk in there's the queen herself mitzi shaw there's eddie griffin i mean paul mooney on a sunday night all talking to mitzi and i had a fucking showcase but i had that night when i went up that monday night eddie griffin was there and he watched me and I was a fan of Eddie Griffin. Yeah. He had a joke about 
that uh, the guy who invented the telephone, what's his name? Alexander Graham Bell. What's the guy? He said that Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone because he did cocaine and he needed to talk to somebody. So that was his big joke okay. that, you know, yeah. I saw it on HBO. So I went up to him and I'm like, I love that joke about Alexander Graham Bell with cocaine. So he knew, I really knew his material. So it was weird. I went in there for the first showcase and Eddie Griffin was there. And I went up to Mitzi and I go, hi, I'm Joey Diaz. I'm number four on the list. And he turned around. He goes, Mitzi, keep your eye on him. He's a funny. Fuck I yeah. saw him last week. My heart almost fucking broke. I'm like, oh, my God. And he sat next to Mitzi. And he told me when I got off, when I got off, Mitzi Shaw pulled me towards and she goes, can you come back next week and do 10? And I'm like, yeah. Fuck yeah. I and then he, he came out and said, listen, I sat next to her so nobody would talk to her. That's nice. Come back next Sunday, you know, and do 10 and I'll be here. Next Sunday was going to be my 34th birthday. I was going to turn 34 on February 19th, 1997. And I'm like, this will be fucked up if I don't become a regular. She tells me, no, like, this will be fucking heartbreaking. I went down there on Fe Sunday, February 19th. I did my 10 minutes and she fucking made me a regular. When I got yeah. off, she goes, start calling in the spots tomorrow night. And I nearly broke down. Yeah. Like, I just fucking broke down. Like, all the pain from the divorce, all the pain from prison, my mother. I just remember going in, like, walking down the stairs and going into the men's bathroom and just, I didn't want to touch the toilet with my fucking hand. <laughs> I got, like, a towel. Yeah. I closed the toilet and I just sat there and broke down. I cried my ass off. I was now a regular at the world famous comedy store. When I got to LA, I didn't think I could do anything with my life. Never mind be a fucking regular. So by February, I had gotten to LA January 27th or 29th, 1997. By February 19th, not even a month in LA, I was a regular at the fucking comedy store. So my fate was fucking sealed right there. I knew it. I'm like, now I got to work hard because I'm in the fucking major leagues. That's what and I'm we'll, saying. We'll, we'll end right there. That's perfect because now it just begins. That's what's going on. We've done like 10 goddamn episodes and we're just beginning. <laughs> All right. So wait, I have to put this audio stamp in here. So I remember we're picking up where, where exactly, what month and year exactly, what, 97? March of 97. March of 97 is where we're going to pick up next time, brother. I love you. Thank you so and much. I just want to make one announcement. Yeah, yeah I was going to say that, promote it all. Uh, the Soprano movie, obviously, October 1st. The trailer is out. And also, my weed strain is coming out. It came out. You have one? This is. Yeah, it's called At Laughing Gas on Instagram. You know, get on there so you can see. It's going to be sold exclusively at the ice cream shop. Off Ventura Boulevard. Oh, I'm going to get that. Studio then. City. It's 31%. And it'll knock you the fuck out. It's Joey Diaz fucking, <laughs> you know, hand picked. You know, they took care of me. And so trimmed, motherfucker. <laughs> and trimmed. It's called Laughing Gas. And it'll be exclusively at the ice cream shop in Studio City. Thank you very much for having me on, brother. I love you. You know I do. We're going to keep going until you wrap it up, my man. I love you too, man. Thank Take you. Care and have yourself. a great you, week. It was you great too, to see you. Bro. Same, man. And as always, RyanSickler.com, Ryan Sickler on all social media. We'll talk to you all next week.